All right, I think we are about ready to get started. Everybody, thank you so much for being here. For those of you coming in, let me just take a look at one thing. I see the participant list is, is going up and up and up, which is beautiful to see. Um, we'll give everyone about two, three, about 30, 20, 30 seconds probably to get started, uh, to get settled in. And then we'll start uh, with a couple of opening remarks and then we'll turn it over to someone far more important than either myself or Stefano, and the reason why everyone's here, Juan Melendez. <clears throat> All right, so we are coming up on about 40 some odd attendees right away, which is great to see. We're also streaming on Facebook Live at the Law Office of David P. Shapiro. You should be able to follow that way as well. And for those of you out there who may not be able to stay for the entire presentation, as long as you RSVP'd, we're going to send out a recording if for whatever reason you need a record, you need the recording and you don't get it by next week, you can just send us an email. Uh, my email is david at dpshapiro.com. So D-A-V-I-D at D-P-S-H-A-P-I-R-O.com. So again, thank you so much. It is Thursday evening, June 4th. Uh, my name is David Shapiro. I am one of the partners at this law office. Law office, David P. Shapiro. Uh, also on the screen, in the screen is my partner Stefano Molea, who is there, and obviously in the screen as well is Juan Melendez. Um, it is a very, very, very interesting time, as we all know, and there's a reason why, on this day, in this time, that we reached out to Juan. I first met Juan in 2006 when I was finishing up my time in New Orleans at Tulane University Law School. And New Orleans was uh, going through a difficult time. Hurricane Katrina pretty much ravaged the city and that whole area in the summer into the fall of 2015. We got back to school. And in January, I was a president of the Criminal Law Society at Tulane University. And we're thinking, hey, what can we do? What can we do to bring in a speaker to really get the community excited? to get people together far beyond what we were doing at Tulane. We had Loyola Law School. We had groups in the community there. And we found one. And we reached out to him and, and brought, him to, brought him to New Orleans from, from Albuquerque, where he lives in New Mexico. And it was an absolute fantastic, fantastic speech, fantastic presentation. We had a great night. We went out to dinner afterwards and have obviously kept in touch ever since. And here we are 14 years later in the midst of, of very, very interesting times, um, times when we could affect a lot of positive change. And we are all going through different degrees of healing and different degrees of needing an uplifting story right about now. And we figured who better than to give you that story about perseverance and a positive story uh, about the criminal justice system, at least on the back end of it when he became free after serving 17 years, eight months and one day for a crime that he did not commit. So it is our great pleasure on behalf of myself, on behalf of Stefano, on behalf of the entire firm to turn it over to Juan Melendez. Before I start, I wanna thank God for keeping me alive all this time. And I wanna thank David P. Chapiro's uh, law firm for making this event happen. As I tell my story, if you feel like cry, cry. If you feel like laughing, please laugh. I love smiling faces. The only thing I ask, the only favor I ask is this, please don't fall asleep on me. It was a beautiful day. I never forgot it. It was on a Monday, May the 2nd, 1984. While my coworkers and I was eating lunch on the apple tree, we hear noise in the oaches that did not belong to the oaches. It was about eight police cars riding the hills, FBI agents. And they stopped in front of us and they came out of their cars pointing weapon at us. And they told us to hit the ground and we did. Then they called my name, but I'm scared to get up because of the weapon that's pointing at me. But I raised my right arm. Then they told me to get up and walk out with them. And I did. When I got in front of them, they want me to open my mouth. They want to see if I had a missing tooth. And I show it to them. Today, I fist them and I'm still working on it. Then they told me to roll the sheet, the, the, the sleeve of my shirt from my left, my left arm. They want to see a tattoo. And I show it to them. 
Then they say, yes, you are the man we are looking for. You are wanted for unlawfully fly to avoid prosecution with warrants for your arrest for first degree murder and armed robbery in the state of Florida. So they ran me some rights and they throw me in a police car and they took me to a federal prison. A week or so after that, they took me to court in front of a judge, in front of a magistrate, a federal judge, and he was talking about extradition. But I did not know what extradition mean. I was naive to the law, naive to the language. This is the type of English I know at that time. If I say three words in English, believe me, my friends. If I say five words in English, believe me, my friend, three of them will be cuss words. So the Brown interpreted to me to explain to me what extradition mean. And all he told me in Spanish was this, you either wave it or fight it. They gonna take you back anyway. So I start thinking, I'm not a killer. My mama did not raise no killers. So I will wave it. And as soon as they see this ugly face in Florida, they will let me go. But how wrong I was. So I waved this tradition and they extradited me from the state of Pennsylvania all the way back to the state of Florida. A week or so after my arrival, they took me to court in front of a judge. And he was reading the charges to me. You've been indicted, arrested for first degree murder and armed robbery and the state of Florida is sinking the death penalty against you, the electric share. A week or so after that, they took me right back to court to the, with the same judge, this time to court upon a lawyer for me, a public defender. The true fact is, I'm not O.J. Simpson. I don't have money to hire lawyers. So this public defender that they brought to me, I did not hardly understand what he's saying because they never gave me an interpreter. But, he used to pat me in the back and tell me that everything is going to be all right. You will go home. I did understood that going home stuff. I should go home. I did not commit the crime. So now we're going to trial. Monday, we start picking the jury. Tuesday, we're still picking jury. And after they pick 11 whites, one African-American person, a black man, six women and six men, then they introduce, they introduce a, 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 the, the jury to they, they introduce something to tell them how to conduct themselves in a capital murder case with a sinking, the death penalty. Wednesday, that's when the evidence come in. And this is what they had against me. They have what they call a police informant. What they call in the streets, a snitch. He claimed that I confessed the crime to him. This police informant, this snitch, also implicates a friend of mine in the crime. He gets arrested, he's interrogated. He makes 15 statements. He incriminates himself in the crime. He gets charged with it. First degree murder, armed robbery, and they threaten him with the electric share. It's time to make a deal. You see, prosecutors in the United States they make deals with criminals. So he was able to strike a deal with the state. He gets his first degree murder charge dropped. He gets his armed robbery charge dropped all the way to accessory after the facts. No more threats of the electric chair. He gets two years probation. With two years, he already had. And basically what he said in trial was this. I picked him up took him to the scene of the crime, dropped him off, came an hour and a half later, picked him up again, took him home, don't know what happened to after it happened. This is the entire evidence against me. No physical evidence against me. This is the testimony of two questionable witnesses with a criminal record from coast to coast. Two questionable witnesses that make deals with the state and they get rewards and lenses for their own crimes they commit. This is what I had on my favor on the defense side. I have what you call an alibi witness. I have four witnesses corroborating 
the alibi testimony. I had other witnesses testify and saying that the police informant, the snitch, had a grunge against me. But I had a problem. All the witness, witnesses that I had on my side was from the African-American race. A black woman, a black man, and when a black woman and a black man testify for the state, for the prosecutor, all of a sudden, they got good credibility. They even dressed them. I never saw my co-defender with a three-piece suit on. I never saw my co-defender with a clean shave. In the streets, they used to call him the wolf. But when a black man and a black woman testify for the defense on my side, all of a sudden, that credibility is gone. Thursday, they found me guilty. Friday, the very next day, they're sending me to death. And the judge complained that it was taking too long. When they sent me to death, my heart got full of hate. Hated the prosecutor, hated the judge, hated the jurors. And I hated that one that pat me in the back, my trial defense lawyer, because I felt he betrayed me. But overall, I was scared, very scared to die for a crime I did not commit. So now I'm going to death row. This was an ugly day. I never forgot it. It was on a Tuesday, November the 2nd, 1984. The place was horrified. It was dark. It was cold. They keep in a six by nine foot cell. And every time they move me out of the cell for whatever reasons, I got shackles in my legs, chains in my waist, and handcuffs in my wrist. The place was also infected with rats and roaches. So they throw me down in the bottom floor. 17 come then they wrote prisoners in the bottom floor. 17 in the second one, 17 in the third. And I made the 248 men condemned to death in the state of Florida, send the race data, the death penalty in the nation in 1976. The food, they put the food on the car and they wheel that car and the floor and the wing where you at. And breakfast, oh, that's the worst one. Not because of the food. I love grits and eggs. It's because they come real early and they never wake you up. And they place that breakfast tray in a flat that you have in your cell, cell door, like a mail slack. And if you wait five seconds and you don't to get up and get that tray, forget about it. You ain't run out of luck. You see, the roaches, they, are, they beat you to it. They waiting for the breakfast too. And it get cold in Northern Florida and they supply us with a thin blanket. And I take that blanket and I cover myself from foot, face and all. I don't wanna see nothing. But the rats, they also get cold. And they wanna get warm. So they climb that blanket. And I can feel that rabbit running up and down. And I don't wanna look at them. Because if I look at them, I'm not gonna be able to sleep. But when that rat stays still in my chest and he's not moving, I get a good grip of the blanket. And I shake it hard as I can. And I can hear that rat hit the floor. Boom, it is a big one. So I arrive over there on a Tuesday, not that Thursday. The following Thursday, they executed the 10th person in the state of Florida. When I leave that place, 51, today, 99 and still coming. But when they executed that tenth person, I got super scared. You see, I do not know the language that well. I do not know the process. I'm lost in there. So the thoughts in my mind is this. They're killing people here every week. How long is going to be before they get me? So I know how to box. And I know all this exercise, you can keep your muscle flexible and you can defend yourself. So I'm thinking, 
if they come over here to get me, I'm just going to fight them. And I walk into that chair. When I think about it, I'm in scared of electricity anyway. So I had to come up with a plan. I took the cheese on my bunk and I cut it all in pieces. And I took them pieces, them threads, and I made little ropes with them. And I took these little ropes and I tied the cell door bars. You see the cell door bars like, like this. I tied this end. When they push the bottle in that control room, that door is moving nowhere. So I'm thinking, by the time they cut all these ropes all over up, I can give me a good warm up. And when they come over here, I'm just going to fight them. So now I'm doing exercise. And I'm sweating real good. I'm trying to make muscles come out of my eyebrows. You see, I'm trying to scare these people. I'm trying to intimidate them. But all the time, I'm the one intimidated. I'm the one scared. So it's around count time. And the door's all tied up. And he comes this correction office to do his round and count. He was an African-American person, a black man. Tall. He had muscles in his eyebrows. So when he see the door so tied up, he gets angry and he start cursing. Melendez, why you got the damn door so tied up? I do not know too much English, but I know how to curse. So in a very, very bad way, I remind him of his mother, father, all the way down. So now this correction officer and I, we just cussing each other's out. And the rest of the condemned men to death, they got involved in the argument. But to my surprise, was against me. They tell me that I'm wrong. So now I get angry with them. And I tell them the best way I can. I know they're killing people here every week and we ain't doing nothing. We're supposed to fight these people. We're supposed to burn the place down. We Puerto Ricans, we don't go out like that doing nothing. We fight. They still told me that I was a fool, that I was crazy. They told me that all I do is get up in the morning, get in that cell door bars, and nag, and curse, and cry about my innocence. They told me that I did not know how to read. I did not know how to write. And, and I did not know how to speak English. Then they told me the most beautiful thing I could hear that time. They told me they can teach me. The worst of the worst. The most indesirable and hated people in this nation. They wanted some prosecutors called monsters, thought this Puerto Rican, how to write, how to read, and how to speak English. If they would never taught me, I could never survive that place. I could not be able to talk to my, better to my lawyers. I could not be able to reply the letters that so many pen pals wrote me. Some of them, from that great city of San Diego, California, that show me so much love, so much compassion, that make me feel like a human being. And today, I will not be able to share to all these listeners this sad story. I spent 17 years, eight months, and one day in Florida death row for a crime I did not commit. After 10 years, I was tired of it. I went out of there, but the only way out is to commit suicide. And believe me, lots of my friends committed suicide. And I'm gonna tell you how to do it. They got what they call a runner. A runner is an inmate that's doing time in prison population. He's not sentenced to death. And they give this inmate out of prison population so he can do the work in the devil place. You see, 
the correction officers, they don't do nothing. All they do is watch you. And some of them will give you a hard time if they can. This, this inmate, this runner that's not sending to them, he is the one that supplies us with the food, the toothpaste, the toothbrush, the map and the broom so you can clean yourself. He also can supply you with a tool that you can take your life with, and he knows it. All you got to do is give him four post stamp or a pack, a cigarette rolling paper tobacco, the cheap kind, and he will give you this tool. Perhaps he do it because these items that I just mentioned are more important to him than your life. Or perhaps he do it because he called himself a sitting you, helping you. He works there. He know that you want out of there. He know that their role is hell. The tool is real simple. It's a garbage plastic bag. And when you see in the garbage can, the strong kind. You give him four post times and when the guard is looking, you will swing that bag inside yourself. You get that bag and you twist it all open. You make a rope. Then you put a noose in it. You put the noose in your neck and you tie the other part, the long part, in the cell door bars. You throw yourself down. You're dead, but you're free. That's what the demons used to tell me. Why? Why you got to go to all of this? You're supposed to be a Puerto Rican man, a real macho man. Don't satisfy them, satisfy yourself. You say you didn't do it. You think they're gonna believe you? They're gonna kill you anyway. So grab that bag. And that thoughts stay in my mind. I never saw my friends kill themselves because I cannot see through the walls. But I always look when they will the body out. You see, something in the back of my head tells me. You're not gonna look at your friend for the last time. So I have a mirror myself. And I take it and I stretch, and I stretch my arms to the body with it and I look. And this is what I see. I see a purple blue face that do not look like my friend. I get to see something else too. I get to see the noose in his neck because they never take it out and, and that stay in my mind. So now I want to take this grip. You see, I'm tired of it. I want out of there. I'm depressed. So I tell the runner, give me, give me that garbage bag. So when the guys went looking, I give him four stamps. And when the guys went looking, he swing that bag inside my cell. I took that bag and I twisted it open. I made a rope. Then, I put a noose in it. Then I look at the rope and I look at my bunk and I say to myself, I better lay down and think about this a little bit more. So I lay down and when I lay down, I fell in a deep, deep, deep sleep. Then I start dreaming that I'm a little kid again. Do the things I used to do when I, when I was a little kid. The things that make me happy, the things that make me smile. You see, uh, I born in Brooklyn, New York, but I was raised in the island of Puerto Rico. They took me back when I was this, this a little kid. And when I get up in the morning and I look to the east side, it's a wonderful mountain. And, I, and if I walk six minutes toward the south, I find myself in the most beautiful beach in the world. It is to me. So here I am, dreaming that I'm swimming in the amazing Caribbean sea. The water is warm. The sun is so bright. The sky is so blue. The palm trees look so good. It's a beautiful day. Then I get to see something that I never saw before. 
all dolphins coming my way. And they passed me. Then they turn around. And a pair got on one side. And a pair got on another side. And they start flipping and jumping like dolphins do. I'm having a ball in there. I'm so happy. Then I look to the shore. And it's a beautiful woman, beautiful lady, waving at me, throwing kisses at me. And she seems so happy. And I know why she's happy. She's happy because I'm happy. That's my dear mother. And then I wake up. When I wake up, the bones smell like a beach. So I take that, that rope that it is made to take my life with. And I walk straight to the toilet with. And I look at the toilet. And I look at the rope. And I say real loud, I don't want to die. And I flush it. But the truth fact is, it was lots and lots of beautiful dreams. Every time I got depressed, every time I went out of there, Every time suicide thoughts came to my mind, I would pray to God, send me a beautiful dream. And I was wise enough to grab all them dreams as a sign of hope that one day I would be out of there. That I would be free. Like God was telling me, hey, I know you didn't do it, but I control the time. You get out. When I say you get out, you just got to trust me. When I analyze, analyze everything, I come to one conclusion. It took 17 years, eight months, and one day to also change the man. The death penalty. The death penalty is a law made by human beings and carried out by human beings. We all know we humans, we make mistakes. The death penalty is also a law that brings a lot of suffering, a lot of pain on both sides of the family, on the family victims of homicide, and the family of the woman and man that's condemned to death. What family concern, this is all I have. Mama and five ants. I do not know how the ends are in this generation. But in my generation, when I was go growing up, if my aunt caught me doing something wrong, believe me, my friends, it's gonna be a good ass whooping. And then I got to get on my knees and pray to God. Did she not tell mama? Because when she tell mama, it's gonna be another good ass whooping. But when I was hungry, my aunts always fed me. When I needed clothes, my aunts always bought it for me. And in death row, they never forgot me. They wrote me lots and lots of letters. They sent me lots and lots of pictures, photos of the one that born and I never seen. And I saw all of them grow up to pictures. They love to keep the family together. And mama, I have to tell you, I believe she suffered more than anybody. She also wrote me lots and lots of letters. Letters that gave me so much hope that helped me keep the will to live. But it's one letter that I keep with me all the time. And when I'm down and out, sad and weak, I read it. And it always boosts me up. And it go like this. She wrote and say, son, I just build an altar. In that altar, I put the statue of the vision of the Guadalupe in it. And I prayed three rosaries a day. And I call roses and I put it in it. And I'm thinking and I'm looking, searching for a miracle. And that miracle will come soon because I know you are innocent. And God knows that you are innocent. But you got to put all your trust in God. And one day, He will send you free. 17 years, eight months, and one day, that miracle came true. Thank you, God, but it took too long, God. 
And this I find out a week or so after I've been out. I went to my mama's room and I noticed that tears was running down her cheeks. And I said, mama, what's wrong? And she said, son, in spite of all that faith and hope that I have in God and the vision of the Guadalupe, for all the years, for all the long, long years, I was saving money to bring the dead body back to the island of Puerto Rico and bury you if the state of Florida will have a security. And no mother in this world should go to that pain. The conditions, oh, especially the medical conditions. Oh, you better not get sick in there, bro. You see, they love to use common sense, and the common sense is always against you. Why give you, a person condemned to death, the best medication? When the governor can sign you their warrant today and kill you tomorrow, why waste the best medication in somebody that's condemned to death? In order, in order for all of you to understand or comprehend the condition and the, some, of the, some of the type of people that work in these places, Unfortunately, I have to share with all of you another sad story. We go to the yard for exercise for hours a week. Two hours on a Monday, two hours on a Wednesday. If it's not raining, all they got to see is that, that cloud in the sky. In climate weather today, no yard, no exercise, and it's not one drop of rain falling. But this Monday we all went, all of the ones that taught me how to read, how to write, and how to speak English. Very particularly this African-American person, this black man, I call him brothers. They all taught me how to read, how to write, and how to speak English. But this one in here was very pushy. You need to learn this, you need to learn that. And I love him dear for that, because I learned a lot from him. The brothers, they love to play basketball. Some others, they play volleyball. I like to lift weights because I can burn steam more faster than, and perhaps I can rest in the cell better. So my brother's playing basketball and all of a sudden he falls to the ground. And we all got concerned and ran close to him. When I got close to him, I noticed that white foam was calling me out of his mouth, out of his nose. So, Assume this got to be a stroke or a heart attack. So we tell the guards in the gate, you have a man down that need medical assistance. And they take the time with a, with a walking talkie. And they call the clinic. And here come the so-called nurse. It's a tall white man with a great big belly. So they let him inside the gate and they told us in the yard to put our back to the fence. And, and from the gun towers, they put machine guns at us. And you better not move. They will shoot you. So now they laid in this so-called nurse inside the yard. And I noticed that he had no medical bag, but he had something. He had about a half a pound of chewing tobacco in his mouth. And you can see that black stuff that's running to the side. And then he wants to swallow his spits. He is in the yard now, and he's a brother in the ground. So we tell him he's not breathing. He need air. So the so-called nurse say, the so-called nurse say, I had to go back to the clinic and get an accent back. So he walks real slow with his proud and out of himself back to the to the clinic. He comes back walking real slow with his arrogant and proud self back to the yard. He bends down and put that accent tank in my friend's mouth. Then he drops the nurse. And we tell him, he's still not breathing. He needs air. The nurse replied by saying, I got to go back to the clinic and get another accent tank. This one in here is not working. So we tell him, you don't have to. You can do CPR mouth to mouth. But telling one of them to do mouth to mouth CPR to a brother in the ground, you're wasting your time. 
So the nurse looks up. Then the nurse looks down. And he made a racist a statement using these three racist words. The M, the F, and the N. And then I put in my mouth in there. I said, you don't have to. I can do it. You just do the counting. And he agreed. I'm glad he agreed. I'm trying to save my friend's life. So I rushed down there and I took my t-shirt off and I wiped the white foam my friend had in his mouth and nose. And the so-called nurse, he started counting. One, two, three, and I blow air. One, two, three, and I blow air again. One, two, three, and I blow air. And my friend opened his eyes. I see a sign of hope. He's going to live. But all of a sudden, his eyes rolled back. And he made, and he made an expression with his face and mouth that I can see it right now because he never left me. Then he breathed real hard and, and, and air came out. I believe that was his soul that left him because he died right in my arms. So now I'm angry and I want to do something to this so-called nurse that let my friend die in the yard like a dog. When I finish swinging at him, here come the rest of the condensed men to death. Snatch me out of that corner and throw me in the, snatch me out of there and throw me in the corner. And they say, Puerto Rican Johnny, don't get in no more trouble that you already are in. We got all the ways to handle this. I still go to the hall to solitary confinement for 90 days for disrespecting the for instigating a riot and disrespecting a member of the staff, whatever that means. But I learned a lesson. I learned that I had to sing and look and trust something more powerful than the system. And the only thing I could see that's more powerful than the system is our creator. God. Some of them become Muslims and they praise and they teach others, they praise Allah and they teach others how to read, how to write, how to speak English. Some of them become Buddhists. I don't know what they praise, but they teach others how to love, how to have compassion, how to find a way to forgive. Some of them become Christians. That's what I did. I had to go back to my roots and remember everything my mama taught me about Jesus Christ, Virgin Mary, and the Holy Ghost. The true fat is, he's Catholic to the bones. And, and, this, and this is my personal opinion, and only mine. I believe we serve in the same God the different names that all we got to do to go to heaven is make good choices in life, do good deeds, and we don't have no problems going to heaven. This friend of mine that the state of Florida let him die in the yard like a dog, one month after his death, he wins a new trial. By the state of Florida letting my friend die in the yard like a dog, the state of Florida denied my friend his right to prove his innocence. So all you know now about the suffering and pain of the death row prisoner and the suffering and pain of his family. You know about a little about the condition, especially the medical condition and some of the type of people that work in these places. Let me tell you the worst. The worst is when they execute someone. You see, I'm in this cell. Next to me is another person condemned to death that I know for 10, 15 years, perhaps more. He cries in my shoulders. I cry in his. He shared with me the most deep thoughts and I share mine with him. I slowly, learn to grow 
who loved him. And then one day they snatch him out of that cell. And I know what's gonna happen. They're gonna kill him. In my time, it's the electric chair. And they got to generate the chair with electricity because it's 2010 bolts that gotta go through his body in order to get him killed. And I can hear this bossy sound. Uh, 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 that still in my mind, I cannot stop it. And I know precisely the time when they burn the light out of him because the lights go off and on and I cannot stop it. But the saddest part at all is this. Some of them are innocent. Like Jesse Tefago, Benny Dens, Leo Jones, Pedro Medina, and my homeboy from Puerto Rico that the state of Florida on a legal plea bargain offered him five years. He did not took it simply because he did not commit the crime. And I cost him his life, Angel Nevis Diaz. And all I can say is this, I see you soon. But enough the sad stories. Let me tell you how I got out of there. And I'm gonna tell you right from the jump, I was not saved by the system. I was saved by the grace of God. Some lawyers would call it luck. I call it a miracle. So here comes my attorney with tears running down her cheeks. And she tells me, one, I cannot handle the case no more. And I say, why, Miss Gale? I don't need no new lawyers now. You know my case better than anybody. And she said, you know why? I lost my clients. They are your friends. No mistake when she say she lost five clients. It's five human beings that the state of Florida, the governor of Florida, legally killed. If one of my listeners wants to become a criminal lawyer, and I wish you will, we need you. Be careful with the definitive cases. They can get to you. So, Miss Gail, my attorney say, Juan, this don't, don't worry about it. I'm gonna get the agency to assign for you the three best lawyers they got and the best investigator. I finally got the dream team. So here comes my new lawyer. And he tells me, Melendez, you have lost too many appeals. I told him, tell me something new. So he tells me, but we're gonna try one more time. But if you lose this one, you'll be lucky if you leave three years. I say if I lose this one, I'd be lucky if I leave a year and a half. You know who the governor of Florida is. He wouldn't have no problem in signing my dead one. So his strategy was to send the investigator out to see my trial defense lawyer. Remember, they wanted used to pat me in the back. And the first miracle occurred. My trial defense lawyer, they wanted used to pat me in the back. He just became a judge. And I thank God that he became a judge. You see, by him becoming a judge, he creates in the legal world a conflict of instruments. And that conflict of instruments gave me the opportunity to boom my case out of that racist county, out of the county where they fabricated the case against me, out of the county where the good old boy network operates. And it moves from Alto, Paul County, Florida. And by the way, don't go over there. It moves to his borough county, Tampa, Florida. And it falls in the hands of a brave, curious woman. A woman that wants to do the right thing. A woman that I can sincerely say without hesitating, I owe her my life. Her name is Honorable George Barbara. 
pledge. So going back to the story with my investigator, going to see my trial defense lawyer, the one they used to pat me in the back, and this became a judge. He tells her, I'm a judge now. I have a new office. But in the old office where I used to do my defense work, I think it's a box in there with the name Melendez on it. You can go over there and have it. So she rushed over there to that old office and found that box, took that box to her office and, and went inside, inside there and dug out a tape cassette and she played it. Guess what? The confession of the real killer was in that tape cassette. And my trial defense lawyer had it one month before trial. This opened a can of wounds now. The case in the hand of a brave, curious woman that wants to do the right thing. So when Honorable Barbara, Barbara, George Barbara Fletcher, listened to the take confession of the real killer, she immediately made a court order to the prosecution office and demand that he send any papers, any documents, any notes on my case. If he has, he has some to do so. And he did. Guess what? He had a copy, a transcript of the take confession of the real killer. He also had it one month before trial. But he had something else too. He had 16 documents that corroborated the take confession of the real killer. 16 documents that he never turned in to trial defense lawyer at the time of the trial. What creates in the legal world a Brady rule violation. We're holding excavatory evidence, evidence that indicate that you did not commit the crime. By that time, I already had three eventuality hearings, and I was able to establish more than 20 witnesses that also corroborated the take confession of the real killer, including the wife and sister of the real killer, including law enforcement officers, criminal lawyers, former prosecutor investigator, former FBI agent, friends of the real killer. In the end, they had found physical evidence against the real killer. The real killer was also a police informant. So now Honorable Barbara, Barbara, George Barbara Fletcher got all this ammunition and she decided to write a 72 page opinion on it. And that 72 page opinion, she chastised the prosecutor for the way he handled the case. She chastised law investigators for the way they investigated the case. And she chastised the man that pat me in the back for the way he called himself defending me. And she granted me, ordered me a new trial. And in and, and the 72 page opinion, he really implied that you have an innocent man in death law. The prosecutor decided not to process the case grab the case, dismiss the case. And that's why I'm here. Thank God, talking to all you listening now. I did not know the time and date they was going to release me. It got me totally by surprise. They put shackles in my legs, change in my waist, and handcuffs in my wrist. And they took me to a place they called the information room. It's not that far from the, the penalty place, yes. They send me in a chair, in front of me is a desk, behind a desk is a lady working on computers. And she start making some naive, silly, stupid questions. She asked me for my social security number. I give it to her. I know about her, but I wonder why she wanted it. Then she, she start making some more silly, naive, stupid questions. Who you working with? What kind of job do you have? And I must give her a real look, a look because she got up of the chair she was sitting on and put both hands in the desk that was in front of me and, and, and looked at me and she said, Melendez, you do not understand what's going on in here, do you? And I say, lady, I don't have the slightest idea. I, live, I stay close, across the streets. I've been in there for almost 18 years. I'm in that row. They don't have no jobs in that row. Then she said she came very more closer to me, almost, almost whispering in my ears. And she said, we are, fi we are fixing your paperwork. 
you gonna be released today. I do not know if you watch cartoons. And you see this cartoon character. He gets a slot hammer. He's the other one inside the head with it. And you, you can see that lump go up. And you can see he got a ring of stars around his head. He's in a state of shock. But he's smiling. That's how I was. In a state of shock, but smiling. And I'm still smiling today. Then the correction officers, they start acting different. They offer me soda pops and sandwiches. I say, I don't want no sandwich. I don't want no soda pop. I want to go back to my cell, pack everything up, and get the hell out of here. And then I had to take physicals. And I never seen these people work so fast. I was the first, first, first one out of uh, uh, anything. They're moving people out of the world, out of the way to attend to me. And then they start calling me something that they never called me before. They start calling me Mr. Melendez in some kind of way. I liked it that. So now I'm in the cell packing up my personal stuff. And this about everybody in Devro know that I was going to be released. And I want to say goodbye to my friend in the last cell. I got a big smile in my face and I got tears drawing down my cheeks. And when I got in front of him, I could not say nothing. All of a sudden, I got sad because I leave them behind. The ones that told me how to read, how to write, how to speak English, and such a stint. I didn't let hate and anger go. And I know the destiny. If we do not abolish the death penalty, perhaps they can kill them all. He had tears running down his cheeks. He had a smile on his face, but he was able to talk. And the first word that came out of his mouth was this. Don't get in a trouble out there. Then he say, take care of yourself. Then he say, don't forget about us. And the last word was, take care of you, mama. They all know my mama. This, this dead row prisoner that shared these kind words with me before I left, his name is Clarence Hill. He changed it to Rasha because he became a Muslim. He did a brother out of Alabama. Unfortunately, I have to tell you that. Seven o'clock p.m. on a 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 Wednesday, two thousand and seven. He was executed. May God bless his soul. So this about every one of them was telling me the same thing. And before I get to that door that go let me out of that wing, out of that floor, I hear a clap. Then I hear a second clap and a third clap. They was making so much noise, clapping their hands, whispering, and banging the cell door bars that the correction officers got angry with them and told them to shut up, be quiet. They didn't stop making noise to alert that place. They was real happy to see me go. So now I'm in the door that go lead me to freedom. So when they opened this door, this is what I saw. I saw a bunch of reporters, ABC, PBS, the whole letters of the alphabet wasn't there. And no offense, no disrespect. Reporters sometimes make some silly, naive, stupid questions. The first one was, how do you feel? I did the Jim Brown on it. I'm feeling good, I'm going home. Then come this female reporter with some more silly, naive, stupid questions. Where you going? What you wanna see? What you wanna do? I did not tell her that I wanna go to Disney World. I told her, and it came naturally, it came from my heart. I told her that I wanna see the moon. I wanna see the stars. I wanna walk on grass, on dirt. I want to hold a little baby in my arm and, and play with him. 
Of course I told her. I want to talk to some beautiful women. That reporter that I had in front of me, she was ugly. But that's a joke and my luck. I miss the thing that we take for granted. The simple things in the, the simple things around me. I cannot understand the people in the free world when they say they're boring. When God has created so many things for us to enjoy, take care, and love. So many good deeds, so many good choices we can make in life. And in speaking about good deeds and good choices, I have a confession to make. I'm still a dreamer. I dream and I pray to God every day that, I, that in my time, I can see the death penalty abolished. But this dream cannot come true if all you listeners don't enjoy me. See, you listeners are part of my dream now. The problem with the death penalty is all about details education people need to know that is racist people need to know it do not deter crime people need to know that it costs too much people need to know that is cruel and unnecessary we have alternatives but the most important thing that people need to know is this along at this the great state of california have it any state, any nation, any country. It will always will be a risk to execute an innocent one. And we can always release an innocent man from prison. We don't have no problems with that. But we can never, and I repeat, we can never release an innocent man from the grave. And that's how we got rid of segregation. And that's like we got rid of slavery. White, black, brown, and Native American Indians together, we can get rid of, of the death penalty. So please, join me in my dream. And let's get this death penalty abolished. And let's get involved in any problem in our community. God bless you. Thank you for listening, and I love you all. Juan, I have seen I have seen you speak now probably five or six times. Uh, this is this being the furthest we've ever been away from San Diego to Albuquerque, and you you never cease to amaze me. You are absolutely fantastic, and we are so <laughs> grateful to have you be here. Uh, and be a source of inspiration for so many people when, when so many people are going through mixed emotions, not knowing what to feel uh, at a time like this, such a critical turning point in our nation's history, especially as it relates to the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for being here. We do have some Q&A if you're open to some questions. I know Stefano has been monitoring that, um, and I'm going to turn it over either to Stefano or Judy at this time to go with the questions. Judy, if you have the questions, um, you can go ahead and uh, get started. You want to say anything? Oh, oh my God. Yes, I do. I have, I have some of these very good questions that have been coming in. Um, I'm just going to go with one of the, the, the first questions here is, how can we help you defeat the death penalty? That's a good question. Uh, Get, in, get involved with, with uh, organizations that are uh, against the death penalty, like the like uh, uh, Amnesty International, uh, Witness to Innocent, and and stay close to uh, to David P. Chapiro. He can help. He can help a lot. <laughs> okay, Judy. Write your laces later. A lot of things. I think because. The death penalty is essentially a state by state fight, um, at least until enough states have abolished that the Supreme Court will then step in and find that uh, the death penalty uh, violates the Eighth Amendment against cruel and unusual punishment. Because it is a state by state fight at this point, um, the most important thing is to get involved 
with a state organization. Mm -hmm. um, most of the states that have the death penalty have an anti-death penalty group, such as in, in California, you have death penalty focus. Um, in other states, you have like the Wyoming Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty or whatever it is. But within your state, the most important thing is to get, get in touch with the state group um, against the death penalty. And then they'll give you specific directions in terms of how effective you can be within, within your state. There you are. <coughs> Um, let's see. So we have a question about your first day of freedom. How did you spend your first day of freedom? It was a, it was very emotional. A, first thing I did, I, I wanted to kiss the ground and I did. A, and I wanted to eat a, 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 a Burger King because we had a TV and I, 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 I used to watch that, the, and look at the Burger King and my mouth used to be get juicy just looking at it. <laughs> So uh, I told my lawyer, I said, man, man you got to take me to a Burger King. And I, and I got my Burger King, and when I ate it, about 10 seconds, I was throwing up. I ain't been in Burger King since. <laughs> so uh, it was, a, it was a, a very emotional a, 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 a day for me, and a very glad day that I will never, never, never forget. And I think soon after, you were released. You went and you visited with some witnesses in the case. Yes, you yes, talk about yes. That maybe? I visited. Family. I visited when uh, visited people that that uh, that uh, went to uh, to help me out and and uh, uh, participating in eventually hearings. And I told my lawyer, I want to say tell thank you to all of them to to went and testify on my on my behalf. And I and I did that. And I wanted to. Uh, to uh, thank the, the judge that, that, that granted me a new trial, but, but because uh, ethics, I could not, could not say thank you to her. But when she retired, I'm gonna make sure that I hug her and give her a nice kiss. <laughs> okay, we have a question here about what, what is the one thing that kept you fighting and focused and optimistic on death row? If you can boil it down to one thing. One thing uh, that helped me a lot, you told me to, to get out? Or? Well, just the one thing that kind of kept you going, oh, well, kept you fighting, focused uh, on I got you, there. I got you. Uh, and that one thing that, that kept me going it was pen pals, people that write me letters. Uh, every time I, I got a letter from, from, the, from, from, from people in the free world, uh, it gave me, a, it gave me the a, a opportunity to, uh, to think that that one day I can be out of there. They, 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 they really encouraged me and they gave me hope. Being innocent also helped me a lot because I was thinking that, that they, I never lose the hope that the truth will, will come out some kind of way. So uh, all that, the family, my mama writing me letters, my aunts, and the, and the, and the, and the, the death row prisoners, when they told me how to read, how to write, how to speak English, that gave me, you know, uh, give me more strength to, to fight. Okay. And then we have another question here. Um, what's the one, people like you to define just one thing, specify one thing um, that you would change about our criminal justice system? Oh, that's easy. Abolish the death penalty. <laughs> kind of what I guess. Say. <laughs> Abolish the death penalty. That's an easy one. Go ahead. Well, there's so much that we, we need to, oh, yeah. to change from top to bottom in the criminal justice system. But for you, obviously, the, the death penalty is, it's, oh, yeah. it's very personal. Very personal. Okay. And we have a question about uh, Pablo Ibar, uh, who I believe is still on death row yeah, in, still on in death Florida. Row. The question about him is, um, do you remember having co coincided with Pablo when you were inside? Because Pablo is on Florida's death row. Mm -hmm. uh, has been on there for almost 26 years. Um, do you remember having having seen him in there? Um, are you still <coughs> currently informed um, about his case, injustice? I don't, his case? I don't, 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 don't really, really remember Pablo Escobar, but I'm very familiar with, with his case because I, 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 I tried to help uh, his family and stuff, but I don't really, really rem rem remember him real good. Uh, you know, I, I, he came in there in the late 90s. I already was moved from, 
Florida State Prison, Florida State Prison to, uh, to Rayfo, which they call it the rack. They build a new facility, their old facility in, in Rayfo. And that's when I got moving. That's when Pablo went to the state, state, the state prison. I was already out of there. Okay. So now we have a question about um, sort of adjusting uh, to, to the free world. And um, specifically, was it difficult for you to obtain a job after release? And then also, was it difficult to adjust generally after release? It's a difficult for all of us that being been locked up for so many years because uh, the technology change, uh, 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 what, what uh, the tools, everything. I find that when I go by jobs, it's all different to me. And yes, uh, when I apply for jobs, and and when they find out that I'm that I'm in, that I've been in death row, that changed the whole thing. I spent 17 years, eight months, and one day in death row. So if I apply for a job, they're gonna tell me, "Where is the last place you work at?" You know what I tell them? Death row, <laughs> and that's killed the whole thing. <laughs> Really, the only way Juan was able to get a job was through um, friends. Mm -hmm. Basically, strangers were not no. were were hands off. They they didn't want anything to do with Juan or give him a job. So it was really his the way he was able to work was 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 just through his own connections and people who who trusted him. And really, that's yeah, right. that's the only kind of jobs you've been able to to mm -hmm. have, right? Through mm -hmm. through connections. Um, we have a question about mm. what happened to the prosecutor who withheld the exculpatory evidence. He was, uh, they, never, uh, they never fired him, but they took him out of the, the range of, 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 of uh, they never, they, after, after, I, after what happened to me, they never gave him no more homicide case. And right now he retired about, I would say about 10 years ago. He retired and that was it. Yeah, and actually that particular prosecutor, this wasn't the first time that he had withheld exculpatory right. evidence. Um, there was a, a federal judge, I believe, in, in Mr. Kelly's case, was it? Yeah, Mr. Kelly case, you got it. Had, had said, that had actually written in, in some kind of an opinion that, uh, yeah, he that had this a habit. particular pro prosecutor, Harvey ha Pickard, had, had a, a habit, habit of withholding exculpatory evidence. So for him not to have been fired outright um, and to have suffered some other kind of more serious consequences is a real travesty. We cannot forget the immunity they have. I didn't take that away from them. Okay. We have a question about, hasn't Juan received payment for having been wrongfully convicted? The only thing they gave me was $100 and a pair of pants and a teacher, that was it. They never, they never apologize. And that's what I really want. I want them to apologize. It, it's more important to me and apologize than, than, than the money. Because if the, if the prosecutor apologize and, and the people that was involved, that did this to me, apologize, they show me that they are human beings and we, and we can go together and try to abolish the death penalty. But he never, the, the prosecutor never want to apologize. Yeah, and and the, the issue of uh, compensation is is very arbitrary. It really depends on what state uh, you were wrongfully convicted in. Uh, unfortunately, Florida has a very very narrow compensation statute, and um, it wasn't a statute that that uh, applied to one in his in his situation. I think that is all the questions. Those are all the questions we've received. Um, Juan, I just want to tell you that I saw you first speak about uh, five years ago and it refueled my passion for criminal defense and for uh, doing what I can to help protect our constitution and make our system better. And I can't imagine how many of other, hundreds of other people you've inspired and um, how much better our criminal justice system has gotten thanks to the work and the inspiration that you provide. So um, thank you. Okay. And I know, uh, I think David has a, a few remarks as well. 
just just in conclusion, obviously we want to thank everybody for being a part of this uh, under these unique circumstances to do this remotely. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something obviously in a way where we can get people from around the country, even around the world on these remote type of situations. So it's a positive sort of turning a negative into a positive one. And we're glad that 14 years from when you and I first met, um, we, we've been able to come full circle. And what's crazy about that is 14 years ago seems like a, a, literally a lifetime. Yeah. And, and to know that you were on death row for almost 18 years, mm -hmm. it, 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 let alone, you know, to be completely exonerated, 100% factually innocent, it just blows my mind to this day, 14 years later, knowing how wrong it was and to see how positive you've been throughout it and to echo what Stefano said, it's just fantastic. So we cannot thank you enough. We hope to have you on again. And, and, and when the timing is right to get you back out to San Diego, we'd love to have you out here. Um, see you and Judy again in person. And uh, again, thank you so much on behalf of everyone here. We have people from Tulane Law School, classmates of mine. We have uh, our wives are on, uh, our, the, rest of, the rest of our team, our other attorney here, our assistants, uh, people through the substance abuse treatment community through a program called Second Chance talking about reentry services here for people being released from custody. Wide array of people uh, that you've touched and you'll continue to touch uh, for as long as you're doing this great work. So enjoy the rest of your evening. I know it's a little bit later there and uh, we, hope, we hope to be in touch soon. Okay, thank you. Thank you and thank all of you and, and let's keep on doing this good work. Absolutely, everyone you take care. Well, good night everybody. Uh, good night. Good night.